Um, Tom's right. I, uh, uh, Harvard University had been blackballed because they'd kicked the ROTC unit uh, off campus during Vietnam. But for whatever reason, I just wanted to go there. <laughs> and uh, I kept persisting and I kept uh, you know, saying no to the Navy because I'd been promised, because uh, I'd done okay at Naval Academy, that after I came for my first sea tour, I could go where I wanted to. But they wouldn't let me go there. And, uh, but they told me I could go to Stanford because the former Secretary of the Navy was there and I could get in there. And, uh, but I persisted and actually got up there to Harvard eventually, kind of broke the mold up there. Then I visited Stanford with the palm trees and the beauties out there and I said, oh, maybe I made a mistake. <laughs> but uh, I was really glad to get up there. Tom was my RA because again, um, I'm a Catholic boy. I told this story a little earlier. Uh, I, you know, went to Catholic grade school and the boys sat in the front so the nuns could hit us quickly with the ruler. If anybody knows anything about Catholic grade schools and, you know, the, girl, the girls were in the back and then went to high school and, uh, and I think I told this story to you when I was chatting a little earlier and it was boys on one side, girls on the other. And uh, then I went to Naval Academy, it was just guys. Then I went to sea and there was no women at that moment at sea. And then I finally got accepted at Harvard and they said, you want to live in a co-ed dorm? I put this great big yes. <laughs> but they knew I was a sailor. So they put Tom as the RA to watch me. <laughs> That's how, you know, I knew he was really there for that major purpose. Um, but very grateful to be back in and see you very much. And I'm real pleased to be here. I don't say it lightly. I jump at opportunities to uh, be back with the youth of America. I told a group this morning, if you go on an aircraft carrier, uh, the average age of the 5,000 sailors out there is 19 and a half. And they fix a nuclear reactor. You don't even ask a question whether your plane's fixed. Pilot just jumps in, takes off, and you give them a little salute, and you just know that young 19 and a half year old youth has done their job. It was tremendous. Uh, and I can remember a story once at the White House when I worked for President Clinton there as his director for defense policy. And the kind of the story epitomizes uh, why this is truly our national treasure. And he had had in one evening five men who had landed on the beaches of Normandy at that historic battle that turned the tides of history in that war against fascism. And he also had in five men who had, uh, uh, five historians who had written about that battle through the prism of time. Because the president was about to go back out there to speak at the 50th anniversary and he wanted to know what it was like from the men who had been there. And historically, what did it mean? And one of these gentlemen got up to speak just before everybody went up to the private residence for dinner with him. And he told the president that as the youth of America landed that day, all their officers were killed. Because in the German Teutonic mind, you cut off the head, the officer corps, the enlisted, the body, at least in their army, would collapse assuredly. But he told the president, little did they understand, these Germans, the American army. There they were, the youth of America, calling the way into the wet sands of Normandy because up there on the bluffs above, the Germans had stationed this division of artillery where shell after shell was coming down. Hell was coming down upon them. And these youth, 19, 20 years old, just wanted to claw and get away from it. Until he said, Mr. President, then you saw what makes America great. These youth just looked at one another and said, we're gonna get the hell off this beach. <laughs> and they picked themselves up by two or threes and they grabbed those bluffs, Mr. President, and then they went over the following months all the way to Berlin. But then he turned back to the president and he pointed at him and he said, Mr. President, don't ever forget that whatever that it is, that it that somehow we instill the youth of America to be like that, that it, Mr. President, is the national treasure you must most cherish. I lived for 31 years with that youth of America, that national treasure. And I learned from them a lot. I think Napoleon said it in a much more vernacular way when after he started firing all his generals uh, because he had just taken over his field marshal. Someone said to him, how can you do this? These generals have been on 30 war campaigns. He said, look, I've got mules who have been on 30 war campaigns. They're still asses. The point is, youth are not burdened by experience. It doesn't mean you don't need adult supervision every so often. <laughs> But that's why I went back to teach, to be rejuvenated, that you are not burdened with experience. So tonight, as I talk about the topic, after Afghanistan, the national security challenges for the next decade, let me first tell you with this mule or ass, <laughs> 
at least where I come from based upon my burden of experience, and discuss these challenges, and then listen to you. What do you have to say? What do you think? What's wrong with what I presented? Because I come down here and I look most forward to the questions because then I get something out of this. As my daughter used to say when I was running for politics, and all of a sudden, she was five years old, and it was my first campaign. And I had about 11 people finally come to an event. And all of a sudden, as I paused, she said, quietly standing behind me, Daddy, do politicians always talk so much? <laughs> so I get to the questions and answers. But first, so you know, as I go through these challenges, I want you to know that at least I have come to operate of looking at this world of ours, that we live in here at home and overseas in terms of national security, with three ideas, three principles, you might call them. The first is the United States must be engaged in the world for its peace and prosperity with all elements of its power. The second is that there must be priorities that we must set based upon our national interest within this engagement. And third, the US United States military is absolutely critical to that engagement. But of all those powers of the United States, it is the one that is going to be giving us diminishing returns on our investment into them in the future. On that very first one, I have come to this conclusion that we serve ourselves best by being engaged in the world based upon the storied history of the United States as a country over the last 100 years. If you all remember reading in the history books that after four decades of imperialism, fighting amongst themselves, bickering amongst themselves, on nationalism, militarism, it gave rise to the great world, First World War, World War I. And our military, along with others, put an end to that imperialism. But then we turned inwards. We failed with the League of Nations. We did not have any, except one, naval arm, uh, arms control treaties in terms of trying to mitigate, to have defense alliances to where there would be injunctions with economic institutions that might have mitigated the rise of the global recession, that, depression that occurred, and potentially prevented the rise, or at least the offensive, of fascism. So World War II occurred, and we, as a nation, with others, won World War II with our military. And then we did something different. We remained engaged in this world through our leadership, through in establishing international institutions, 67 defense arrangements around this world from NATO to CETO. We established United Nations here in America, in San Francisco initially. And then the uh, IMF, the World Bank. And then we won, because of that, the next war. We stopped totalitarianism, the Soviet Union, and won peacefully the Cold War. And then, after that, you've seen us, even in yesterday's newspaper, begin to adapt these international institutions through our leadership, such as yesterday, where the World Bank said, we are now going to refocus upon poverty. Why? Because as Secretary Hagel said yesterday, in a speech at Fort McNair, his first defense speech, as Secretary of our Pentagon, of our military, the Secretary of Defense, that so many of these pressing national security challenges have nothing to do with our conventional military because there are such large economic, cultural, and other types of components to them. And so it is this leadership of ours through international organization that I believe that we have to be engaged in with all the elements of our power. The second one then has to do, which I said was, there has to be priorities. I base those upon our national interests. Let me talk about the two, two of them. The first are vital interests. They are those that have broad, overriding importance to the security, the survivability, the uh, viability of our national entity, where we will do everything to defend ourselves if they attack our territory or to protect our economic well-being. I place China and its emergence on the world scene in that vital interest category. In the military, we call it the strategic interest of ours. And then our important interest. They are ones that, while not having to do with our national survival, they absolutely have an important impact upon our well-being and the character of the world that left unattended to will harm our interest. 
I place, in the military, we call these our tactical issues. I place the global war of terror, the Middle East, Southwest Asia in that category. Because I believe that not only must we engage, we must place priorities within those. And so the third one is this issue of the military. If I learned anything about the military as I watched and I was in it, is militaries can stop a problem. We cannot fix a problem. So after World War I, too, we stopped fascism. But it was the Marshall Plan, that economic plan, that fixed that problem. So Germany is now a democratic member with all of NATO, with all of the European Union, now joined on the democratic side. You can see this between Israel and Gaza Strip. Several years ago, they struck, understandably. And this time, when they had a strike again, it was because Gaza had missiles in the same period of time, four times as many, even striking the cultural center of Israel, Tel Aviv. And so the military struck again. But it didn't fix the problem. It stopped it. I bring that up because, again yesterday, Secretary of Defense stated about our military having to change, to transform. Truly, we must, if, as he said, large components of culture, politics, and, the econ and economics are involved in those national security threats that we do. How well is your military focused to stop a problem today if it doesn't transform to meet those? And potentially, maybe, as we began to see, belatedly, like you saw in Iraq, even be part of fixing the problem. So with that as background, with those three principles, let me just kind of start us on our world tour. <laughs> and since the topic is, after Afghanistan, the challenges of the next decade, let me start with Afghanistan. I was fortunate to go onto the ground in Afghanistan near the beginning of the war. Not anything like our Marine Corps or like our Army. I was there for a very short mission. I'd head of the Navy's anti-terrorism called Deep Blue, but it was more of a strategic operational bent. But I had to go over there for a short purpose. And I saw what we were doing as my classmate, a SEAL, headed our effort over there, riding on a horse. <laughs> that war was being conducted well. And in fact, you could see that the military was about to set up the edifice of security within which could bring our other elements of ours and international power to begin to leave behind a society that would be inhospitable definitely to Al-Qaeda, and almost certainly even to Taliban. I came out after a short period, took command of an aircraft carrier battle group, and then was doing the retaliatory strikes. And of interest in that battle group, I had 30 ships. Only 10 were United States ships. We had the World Coalition Coalition behind us, an international group. I had a Japanese admiral there with me, with four ships. The Japanese hadn't been out of the Sea of Japan since World War II. But they came to us, to our aid at that moment, as the Greeks did, as so many of those nations did, supplying us units. And so once again, here we were, leading an international coalition in order to help mitigate the damage, danger to us and them. And then I was told, take a left turn, leave the Indian Ocean, head on up to the Straits of Ramus, and go head into the Persian Gulf because some thought that we were going to start the running start to the war. But as I went through the Straits of Ramus, the only ones who came with me were the Australians and the British. And right then, I knew something was different. I can remember the, the three-star admiral said to me as we pulled in, what do you think? I said, we're ready to go. He said, that's not what I mean. I said, what do you personally think of this? <laughs> I said, this is a tragic misadventure. <laughs> and for no other reason, we're dividing our forces militarily. But I don't see the clear and present danger to do that for. And so when I became a congressman, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff came forward and testified with the following words, that Afghanistan, this is a few years later, has spiraled downward. And the reason is that in Iraq, we do what we must. 
In Afghanistan, we do what we can. My lesson has always been that of Winston Churchill about war, although he said it about many things. Sometimes it's not enough to do your best. Sometimes you must do what's required. <laughs> and when we took our focus off that conflict and didn't let the attention be permitted to have the remaining forces come in there, forces of the other elements of our power, the rule of law, to fix the literacy rate of women would have done more for the global war terror in the longer term in fixing it than what our military could do in just stopping it. Where at that time we entered, 98% of women were illiterate. So, as I take, looked at that Afghanistan to begin the tour, I go next door to Pakistan, where I agreed with the economist a few years ago that on his front cover said, the most dangerous place in the world. <laughs> I agree. It's the reason I supported the surge, even though Afghanistan was not worth was too costly at that time for the surge. But as we were briefed quietly, off the record, in Congress by the Secretary, is, and if you remember that moment of time, the creature that the intelligence agencies and the military agencies of Pakistan had created, the Taliban, had turned on its maker. And they had gotten, just about the time the president was coming into office, our present president, within 60 miles of Islamabad. And then they remembered what Samuel Johnson said here in America a few centuries before. There's nothing like the prospect of a hanging to focus your mind. <laughs> All of a sudden, the creature was after them. And so they took the visions for the very first time off the border with India and placed them in a combat against the Taliban. And our objective for the surge was to close down those porous regions between Pakistan and Afghanistan so that the Taliban couldn't slip across the border as they marched upon them and as our drones began to decimate the Al-Qaeda hidden in their mist. It was almost an unconventional, conventional pincher movement. For reasons that you can read and understand, it did not work, unfortunately. But the reason I was supportive is this, and why I think Af Pakistan is the, the most dangerous place in the world. They are a nuclear-armed country. We may very well, if the Taliban now, if we abandon them, turn upon them again. But we will not get the 2,000 scientists trained to the most radical Islamic universities out, nor do they want to come. They're the ones that built those weapons. They're the ones who possess and have available to them the nuclear entrails that can now be used and exponentially with these weapons of mass destruction in their hands, this material in their hands that doesn't even have to be built in a born, can make the global war of terror exponentially worse into a possibly vital a strategic interest. And that's why the US engagement with Pakistan remains of such great import. It's the reason I supported the surge, not for Afghanistan. Karzai was corrupt and inept. It was over. But to ensure that that did not become the epicenter <laughs> because of what might occur again. How we do this, this alternative presence there, is going to be vital, in my opinion. Some of it will be business. As Kashmir has begun a relationship, uh, at Kashmir, the relationship between India and Pakistan and business. Some of it will be NGOs, often thought of as the fifth branch of government after the fourth branch of journalism. <laughs> as they do great things over there in faith and other areas. And some of it will be us to be committed to work. Because remember, we are the ones who abandoned them after the Soviet Union departed Afghanistan. We're the ones who made them give us $400 million for a, number, a score of F-16s, and then it would give them the, plan, the planes because they violated an, uh, a nuclear agreement. And once again, we may be on the verge of emptying our presence there in the most dangerous place in the world. So let me now head on west and go to that wonderful place with a great phrase, the Arab Spring. I can remember when it happened, as you all can. And I watched it. And I watched even as it spread, as Muhammad Bazazi set himself on fire, and set the whole Middle East ablaze, including Syria, today. And I remember watching as the military in Egypt had to decide which way to go. 
And all I could hearken back to was the time that I had pulled into Alexandria, a port there, as you know, in Egypt. Got an underway with the several young officers of the Egyptian Navy before we were headed over to the Gulf as an exercise. And then we pulled back in. As when we got off, one of them came up to me and said, Captain, you treat your enlisted men as though they're equal to you. I said, well, I, I can assure you they have due regard for rank. He said, no, that's not what I need. You treat your enlisted men as though they're equal to you. What I walked out of that from, as a human being, we don't, is how he continued. Equal to you as a human being, we don't. That and many other incidents of going around to 80-some whatever countries in the world always brought me back to remember, well, they respect us for the power of our military. And they look at us with awe, with the power of our economy. Boy, do they admire us for the power of our ideals. And so people say things aren't going great, and they're not at times. I mean, how could President Morsi at all think that he could keep silent as they besiege our embassy? And the day before, protect another embassy. And yet, as I watch this, and remember that one of the most powerful elements of our engagement is the power of our ideals, I can remember a story about George Washington. And as you know, after that revolution that had been won by the American army, that had stopped a problem, now it was up to our new politicians to fix the government that we were going to have to bring us into the future. And then we had these Articles of Confederation, fairly useless. <laughs> so useless that the country was adrift. There was no accountability, no leadership. And so the officers who had led the American Revolution asked to meet with George Washington because they wanted to ask him to stage a coup with them and become a monarch again, as they had had before. And when they called, assembled one night with him, they handed him a letter with their request. And before he read it, he reached into his pockets, took out a pair of bifocals and put them on and peered over them, bifocals, at the men assembled there that night and said, not only have I grown old in the service of my country, but I've grown blind in the service of my country. The coup stopped there. The point is, he had reminded the men that this wasn't about their individual desires. It was about the common wheel, the United, would become the United States of America. And we would have ups and downs, much like they will in Egypt and Libya and other places. You've all seen the movie Lincoln. <laughs> Imagine if that man had not been there. We'd be a divided United States, perhaps. And I think things are and need to be set on the right directions. Morsi has gone to Iran and said no nukes. He has said Assad is wrong and Syria must go. He did help to effect some peace with Gaza. But he's not going to be our boy like a President Mubarak had been. And we let him get away with his crony capitalism and his human rights violation as we look the other way. But the reason we have to be firm, as well as supportive, is that we need both Egypt and Turkey to, become sec to be secular democracies, where they can shoulder and hold the suitcase for more of the problems in the Arab world. Because I firmly believe, as I said, this is a tactical issue. Our strategic focus needs to be in the Western Pacific. But before I leave this region of the world, I think this is so important for us to stay so engaged tactically out there with effort. Because remember, this is where the epicenter of energy still exists. It is where the crucible of, of Islam that can affect so much in the world. And it is also a place of some of our most implacable foes starting with Iran. And so before I depart, let me talk about Iran. I've always felt we've been wrong not to have an engagement, a direct engagement with Iran. 
we did it with the Soviet Union. We did it with the then, way back then in the old days, the People's Republic of China, which you called the Red China. We don't do it with Cuba. I don't understand why. Because I'm a big believer in engagement in the world. I don't mean having a cup of coffee and diplomacy. I mean diplomacy that can also hurt, <laughs> as this president has begun to do with much more effort upon this nation. We made a mistake, I think, in that tragic misadventure of Iraq, one of which was to replace or remove that balance of power that had been there with Iran. Now there's a sheer conduit for Iran to support, as it wants to, Syria, and cause even more mischief for us. And so my take on Iran is that, as I had said when I was an admiral in charge of a battle group out there, we should be having an incident at sea agreement with them, much like we do at Russia, with the Soviet Union in the old days, with the People's Republic of China. So some untoward incident from those crazy Iranian revolutionary guards doesn't send us into some sort of undesired, at the moment of time, conflagration. Iran cannot have a nuclear weapon. But the military option should not be on the front of the table, it should be on the back of the table. I can't tell you economic sanctions, finally, that seem to have some decent support multinationally, not complete, but some decent support, is going to definitely work. But for those who have served in the military, shame on any politician that doesn't first try to bring about a resolution to something before you must use our military. Our engagement should lead with our diplomacy, the power of our economy. And as their inflation has risen out of sight and the money has de been devalued and their tank will sit at sea because Lloyds of London will no longer give them insurance to pull into other ports. Potentially this may help us not have to go to conflict. That conflict, unless they have discovered something, which they may have since I've left the military, will be challenging at best. It will take weeks for us to, in order to take down those buried facilities because we'll have to beat down the surface and air missile systems. We will have to be able to continue to flight after flight as we reassess it. And the best prognosis, I think, is as of a year ago, is we could probably stop it for about four years with their desire to start it up again. In the meantime, thousands of mines can be laid in the streets of Ramos, cutting off all energy. Hundreds of missiles can rain down in Israel, as well as Gulf cooperative country states, as well as many of our own unit stations in Bahrain, etc. In short, we better make sure when we do this that the cost is worth the benefit and done appropriately at the time. I think at the same time, Syria, that we have been slow to come to the table. I think early on we didn't know who who was in the zoo. We didn't know what the militia or who they were, but we gave them radio so frankly we could listen in and find out who is who. In my mind, not to be giving them, as you read in the paper the other day, that 500 IEDs have exploded there, not to be giving them some of the devices that could prevent the more moderate forces, to be giving them the vest that can protect their armed troops, to be doing more of the training than the 150 trainers we have in Jordan today, I think is going to leave us without being part of owning the outcome of this in terms of being able to influence it. Because the outcome may not be pretty because it has been waiting so long with some of the more uh, challenging militia that have prisoned in there because of the quick conduit that Iran has now gotten without Iraq there. That never could have occurred if Saddam Hussein had remained there. So as I end this tour, so I don't go on too long and I have time for you to tell me what's right or wrong, let me just quickly hopscotch across Africa. I'm happy to go south more into it. I'm from the northern tier, happy to go to South America, but the Chinese are already all over there. Ask them, they'll tell you, because I want to talk about China first. I'd backpacked through China in the mid-19, sometime in the 1980s, and I was telling somebody a story of this this morning, which is why I decided to bring it back up. It was an immense uh, experience. I was in between ships, couldn't get to one I had to get to. I had to wait for the next one. I had 60 days to leave, something very unusual, so I decided to spend 42, 45 days, flew into Beijing, came out in Hong Kong, back at a time where you didn't see anything but 10 cars at most in Beijing. It was a different place back in the early 80s. And it was fabulous. And as I told the group today, all I can, one of the most, many experiences, some very cool experiences, 
And I didn't get married at 47, so I usually used my time to leave to travel and see the world that navies didn't normally pull into. And I went to Eastern Europe. My father was an immigrant from there. I wanted to visit it. And I went to China for other, to other times. But I can remember going down the Yangtze River, as I said. You know, so I slept in a room with 20 other people on the floor. Very cheap, good prices. Um, can't use a credit card. But if you slept outside, it was a buck for the whole trip. You slept with the sheep, because it was just basically a peasant boat. And I was the only, you know, they'd never really seen. I was famous, because they'd never seen a Caucasian. And as we went down, I'd wanted to go up and see the bridge. Because, man, these guys really drove the ship well. The Three Gorges. I mean, you know, it's all that river is very turbulent. The ship's almost going sideways in order to maintain headway. And I'm a mariner. I wanted to see it. But it was chained off. And this fellow that would befriend me each place, I asked, can I go head up? And he kind of said, check. And uh, the second time I said again. And he mumbled something. And then the third time I said, he said, no. And you know, my lesson, as I said earlier today to someone, was he had already told me no the second time. I'm a Westerner, even more of an American. Just tell me yes or no. I can deal with it. My culture is a little different. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you how many times I said, you want to go out? And she would say, no, I could take it. <laughs> but in this case, here I was just wanting to know. And I always remembered it was like two ships passing in the night. He had told me, and I just, my culture hadn't let me know. So when you read, when I was at the National Security Council, this came back to me. Because I'd brand new there. I'd only been there like a month. And all of a sudden, I get called by Aunt Tony Lake, at the, who's on Air Force One with the president. And he said, Joe, um, the NMCC has just alerted us that we've got an aircraft carrier with a plane that's flying. Uh, within some miles, although they say it's about 15 or 20 miles off of China, outside nautical wa uh, inland waters, which is 12 miles. You own those waters. And that the Chinese have given an alert to shoot down. What the hell's going on from your perspective out there? And we worked all through this thing. They took off. The, our plane was, the, the, the planes took off. We were taking, you know, sky doing back to the aircraft carrier, putting up fires fighters, you know. But again, all I took out of that incident was this. Not only were we talking past each other, potentially, for this superpower that's going to emerge and is emerging in this world, but of great import is it's emerging onto a stage where since World War II, we set up the rules through the international organizations that we rightly wanted to lead for our national security, rightly. We set up those rules of the 67 Defense Arrangements of the United Nations, of the uh, WTO, of the uh, IMF, of the World Bank. If it doesn't want to recognize 12 nautical miles, it's not going to. <laughs> and so for my mind, this is an important issue. Because I mentioned that they're all over South America. They're all over Africa. And they're there for a reason. They want everyone in their population to be able to be like Hazi and Harriet. They want a garage <laughs> with a car in it, with a dishwasher like we had in the 50s and 60s. And in order to accomplish that for that 1.3 billion people, or whatever, in the next 30 years, because they're in a race against time, because in 30 years their population will be inverted to where their youth, their national treasure is small, and the elder is so large because of their single baby policy. And they know it. But it will take the equivalent of the energy that we have consumed in over the last century for them to do it, for the whole world in the next 30 years. And so when they go into that South and East China Sea where we had to carry a battle group, they have called those international waters a core interest. That is the same term, the same euphemism that they use for Taiwan. We own Taiwan. We own the South China and the East China. See, no, that's international law. That's your rule. That's not ours. Because buried down beneath those are wonderful resources of energy. And you can see how 
this effort, rare earth minerals, of which every one of your iPhone has a piece of it in it. Every piece of military communications equipment, all our spy stuff has rare earth minerals in it. Every transistor, everything, chip has it in it. 99% is produced and held in monopoly by China. So when Japan upset it two years ago, they just cut off rare earth minerals to Japan. All the silicon that's produced for solar power panels is produced by China. That's why Solyndra, which hit the front page about the Obama administration funding it, was an attempt where Solyndra had a new technology where we would not have to rely upon solar panels to be silicon. It was a new way of doing it. The problem is the market took over. Silicon price dropped so much, <laughs> even though it was a monopoly by them, that silicon went out of business. I bring all this up not in an overly concerned way, but I can remember being at the National Security Council when I had to fill in for my boss and he wasn't around and Tony Lake would have his weekly meeting, I can remember at least four times we'd walk in and say in the 90s, what's our China strategy? I would ask the same today. The reason I thought Iraq was a tragic misadventure so that we couldn't get in and finish the job in Afghanistan is because it took us off the strategic center of gravity for the, na the United States of America for far too long, which is in the West Pacific. Not in a military way. But it's why this president has moved 60% of our naval forces over there, because of the import of that area as kind of the security edifice, because there's already been four naval conflicts between China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Japan, and Korea. I'm happy to talk about North Korea because China is the real key. As it shut off a few weeks ago, the energy flow to North Korea, which it can do if it really wants to shut down its military. But let me quickly get to my third point so I can open it up. And that third point, as I talked about naval forces moving over there, was our military, where I had said that it probably will be a, it will be a diminishing return on our investment in them because it's the other elements of our power that increasingly will have more to do to shape the world. Are they absolutely essential and vital? And would I join up again in a heartbeat? In a heartbeat. I mean, if you can't be in the Navy, the only best other thing you'd be is a politician. <laughs> That's why you stay in the campaign trail all the time. I loved it because you got to meet people. But let me talk about it in this regard, and then I'll end. In the military, we prize accountability. You know, we said as a group that, you know, in a Navy ship, the captain is given great honor, great privilege, more than any other person on that ship. And with that responsibility goes authority, and with them both goes accountability. But it's accountability for the deed, not the intentions. Let that ship touch ground or let that crew come to harm, and that captain must answer for what he did or failed to do. So unlike Washington, D.C., where it's for your intentions. I tried. We have a lexicon for it. Katrina, WMD, um, AIG, the fiscal cliff, sequester. I tried. Where is the accountability for what they failed to do? But on a Navy ship, on this tradition of the sea that's older than our nation itself, this business of accountability is so important because it, without accountability, it means the end of responsibility and finally the end to the confidence and trust that a crew would have in its captain. Because if the captain feels or is perceived to be above accountability, why trust them? If you know they won't be held accountable for what they failed to do. And if you lose that trust, a purposeful ship will finally disintegrate into a derelict of a ship. A ship of state that can go from crisis to crisis. That occurs with, maybe like the sequester and fiscal cliff, that's his crisis to crisis. I bring that up because I think there's three things that our military needs to look at itself in the mirror in terms of accountability as we go forward. The first is a strategic accountability. The last large change we had in the strategy of our nation, the military strategy of our nation, was in 19, early 1990s under then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Powell. He did what was called the base force. The Cold War had ended, and as he said, we need a plateau. 
to say this is what we have to do for the nation and you can't go below it. So for by wisdom and others, he came up with what's called two major regional contingencies. That is, he said, from here in the United States, we have to go east and we have to go west. And we able to have to do two major regional contingencies nearly simultaneously. And the two he chose, which were the most stressful, was Iraq and North Korea. So we then stepped back and built our force structure based upon those two major regional contingencies. That we needed five aircraft carriers for one and five aircraft carriers for the other. Nearly simultaneously. That means 10 at least and a couple in the shipyard gives you 12. We need X amount of Air Force for that. So many C-17s to carry logistics to them nearly simultaneously, which meant within a week or two of the other. One's in the far western Pacific, and the other is way over in the Persian Gulf. It's a lot of force structure. We just walked through the world's challenges, the global war of terror to China. I didn't see a major regional contingency there. Iraq is over. And North Korea, during testimony, of Iraq, I asked the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, can the Army respond to Iraq, uh, North Korea? And the answer was no. But it's okay. Because the Army's positions and what they need to do can now be filled by the Navy and the Air Force. Well, that's okay. Now Iraq's over. That means we don't need those four divisions that were going to go to Iraq, right? I mean, to North Korea. But your quadrennial defense review that our Defense Department did last year said, we still are based upon two major regional contingencies. Can't tell you what they are, but there's two out there that we've got to have. So our entire force structure, our strategic focus, has to be rightly be, because that's the strategy based upon that, but I thought the challenges were kind of global war of terror all the way up to China. That gets me to my second point, the tactical accountability. Someone asked me a question about the Navy earlier today. And are we building, you know, are we going to match China's? I said, we need a capability out there that's no longer, that's, I guess the way I should have phrased it to him was, we used to say in the military, quantity has a quality all its own. It's the exact inverse today. Capability has a quantity all its own. An aircraft carrier today, the one that I commanded, the George Washington, can strike in 24 hours, nine times the targets that that same aircraft carrier, that same air, the number of aircraft, the same aircraft could do the day George Bush became president of the United States in 2001. Nine times. That means 10 aircraft carriers a day is equal to 90 aircraft carriers before. Why? Because we can do real-time targeting. Satellite sees something, some soldier pops his head up, boom, 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 the aircraft sees it. By the way, it's so precise, you don't have to carry big bombs you have a very precise one that will go right through the right panel of the six-panel window to get it in there in order to get it. So is it best to, buy, to measure ourselves by how many aircraft carriers we have? So China has an aircraft carrier, okay? In other words, bin Laden, would we have found him? Because um, from Tom Schwartz, you're going on too long. <laughs> uh, I'm almost done, Tom. Is, uh, and so the point was that um, I have believed that the, our military is building a very fine military. But is it the really the right military? If particular Secretary of Defense has said, you know, because of the components of po po political, the economic, and other types of components that are in the national security challenges of the future, most of them have no pressing need for conventional force. So will we be building the right military to stop the problems? Take the submarines of China. They've got about 84 submarines. We have about 50, 55, $2 billion a pop. They can build them pretty cheaply, diesels, because they just want to control the South and East, you know, China Sea and all that. And you all saw a red hunt for Red October. One submarine hunts another submarine. Imagine that we could do the same thing we did for our aircraft. Little size Coke can things that you just kind of spread around and as a submarine moves through the water, it upsets the magnetic anomaly. It's a magnetic anomaly kind of upsets it a little bit. But all of a sudden, this little Coke can picks that up. There's three or four of them. They're all spread around. They're five bucks a piece. A little antenna goes up. They crisscross, and some drone comes over and drops a torpedo. In short, knowledge, capability, much like all these Macintoshes you have before in your lap, matter much more than how many, which brings me then to my third point.
and you know, strategy, forces. It's no longer force structure. It's force posture and force capability. And then backfit it into a number. Find bin Laden, have a fast agile force that can get it. And last is fiscal accountability. I ran the Navy's $350 billion five-year defense plan as a three-star admiral, reported the chief of naval operations. I mean, it was equivalent to like the 15th largest corporation in America. It was kind of fun. We had to determine what to do and what not to do. We priced an aircraft carrier. And by the way, I recommended while I was there, and it actually briefed the Hill, that we only needed 35 submarines, not 55. I don't want you to say this is Johnny come lately. Uh, Senator Dodd, who built submarines, when I briefed him, you know, went out, of course, to the press, and that was my first negative ad. I was in the Navy at the time, said I was full of smoke, and I understood that. But he was so very kind. I really like him. When he came in and I was running my first race, he came in to do a children's event because he headed the Children's Caucus. And I was running on National Security Begins at Home in health, education, economic security of our youth as they go forward. As we sat down for lunch, he said, Joe, I remember you. You're the admiral that wanted to cut my f submarine fleet. <laughs> and the point was that there's a lot of, you know, this is something to have a great idea, but it, if it's not right is one thing, but it also has a lot of obstacles, as Lincoln found out in that movie and overcame. But we priced an aircraft carrier. The price of it was $11 billion. The probability that that was the right price, that we worked with industry and the Office of Secretary of Defense, was about 35%. Do we tell Congress? No. Tyranny of optimism. Get it pregnant and they'll keep building it. So therefore, in 2008 programs, we had $300 billion of cost overruns in our military. Would you buy a car from a car dealer who said $22,000? OK, this is Vanderbilt, $45,000. <laughs> if he said to you, five years from now, 33% chance, 35% chance that I got the wrong price, would you buy that car? Particularly when you know his record is $300 billion cost overruns in that year particularly when you know that there are 6,000 budget financial analysts in the par Pentagon Department, particularly when you know there's 2,000 different accounting systems so bad that they're penciled that defense agencies can't even follow how much money they spend, whatever they get, they say they spent, so that Secretary of Defense two years ago said it's futile. We've had the Army spend $7 billion trying to get its accounting system under control because it's buying parts, as it said in press, it doesn't need. But so my take on this is, as I stop, and I'm happy to take questions, because I thought it was be interesting to tee these things up, is I see that the United States needs to be engaged in the world, to all elements of our power. I believe the military is the backbone, but that rib cage that leads us is those other elements, the power of our economy, the power of our diplomacy. I think our military, and there's priorities within those, based upon our interests, from vital down to important. And you can change what those interests were, the administration before this one felt Iraq was a vital interest. Why else would you take our nation to war? And cost a trillion dollars and loss of life. So there can be disagreement in what those are. But make sure your military, just like you are, moving into the knowledge information age. We are too. President Eisenhower, when he said that famous speech, the industrial, military industrial complex, the draft before he made that speech said, the congressional military industrial complex. And he crossed out Congress because he didn't want to upset them as he was departing the presidency. And finally, remember that the power of our ideals truly is one of our greatest powers. The reason that that Egyptian officer said that and how I responded to him was the following. George Washington made sure that we in the military understood that these were equal human beings, all of us together enlisted, as well as officer. When he ensured that the very first medal ever given in the history of this new American army, a piece of purple ribbon, under his orders, was only be given to an enlisted man. Because as he wrote in his orders, he wanted to ensure that Everyone understood in this new American army, just like in this new American society, the way to the top would be open to everyone equally based upon talent. And so you can have a 
gentleman named Charlie Kashvili be born overseas in Belarus and come here to the United States, join as an enlisted man and become chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They don't miss that American dream, that American exceptionalism of who we are overseas. I'll stop and I'd love to take any questions if it's okay with you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, first off, it's how you remain engaged. President Bush decided that preventive war was the way. So we went into Iraq. As Secretary Gates said, you're going to have to be insane to ever put our troops again into a land war in Asia. So the half by which we did our engagement there, if it wasn't for Iraq, I would argue that the strength of that argument point would be a little bit less. Because the global war of terror eventually is a fight for the hearts and minds of people. You could see it that during the tsunami, when we were in Indonesia and other places, and our military carried in and lifted stuff in to save them, to give them food. To, the polls show that the United States image went from like 15% favorability to 60-70%. Look, that isn't just the way, and I know that. But the heft of it doesn't mean our military needs to be poised there to invade Iran. We're not going to. And so the type of resources that take the tactical engagement are different than potentially a China, where all of a sudden they shot down an EP3 on us, as you know, a few years ago. They just forced it to land because it had gotten within 25 miles of Hanan, that island that's off Hong Kong. Things can unduly get up there. More worse than that, it's having Japan and South Korea, Vietnam, and Philippines start to worry about an arms race if we're not there as an honest broker. So my point is that you're absolutely right. If we have something we have to address, and I think bin Laden was one, you put the heaviest of our assets there. But what got bin Laden? Two things. Great intelligence coming from satellites and other things, and you meant, you know, figuring it out. That's a different heft of resources than an aircraft carrier or the others. Second, it has to do with why the sculpture that's closest to the commander-in-chief of the United States office is not an American. It's a military person but it's not a US military person. The sculpture that's closest to the Oval Office where Commander in Chief is, is of an ally. Because George Washington was losing the Battle of Yorktown where we won our independence. And for the very first time in America's history, he chopped operational control. It's called chop. I've forgotten what it means. You could tell me. I've forgotten now if you know too long. Forces to a French general and had him command them. And under his wise guidance, we won that battle, which won our war. And so the sculpture, if you go around Washington, DC, that's closest to recognize the value of allies and friends to us is General Rochambeau, who won our final battle. My point is, our engagement with Pakistan, if we abandon them, because they come from over there, they the terrorists. Now we got some homegrown ones, I got that. If we can't stay engaged with them with relations, with money to help them economically, 
in order to have military relations. But that's a different weight of effort than it is to say 60% of our forces are going to the Western Pacific. So it doesn't mean it's any less important, uh, but I don't for one moment want to back away from that. You know, it's the reason I supported a surge, even though I thought Afghanistan was going to. And so it's the type of, of effort you do. Because we in the military have two things, forces and force. Forces aren't being, can often be present to show our interest. It's why we keep a carrier battle group every so often in the Persian Gulf. Force is actually you're ready to go in and use that carrier battle group. There's a difference in the two. And I think our forces need to be in the West Pacific because the car's backbone, the force, our forces being able to show presence and interest undergirding the other elements of our power. You know, that's why I said fix the illustrative of women. You had done more than you could have, I argue, you know, for, for the global war terror than other things. So that's why I argue. It's not just measured by the military and the shift. First of all, the shift's 10 years old. Should have been done 10 years ago. Second, he was, I think it was wrong to say it's all about a military shift. Hell no. Heck no, sorry. It's about much more than that. You know, what are we doing diplomatically? What are we doing economically? Secretary Clinton, when she went to Asian and other places, was trying to build that up. But we've been absent from that because as difficult as you think, might not think it is, it's hard to conduct two wars at once. It's hard to handle recession at home. And oh, by the way, China's over there. <laughs> And I think we've missed a great opportunity to transform our military, to also get the right focus, to deal with them, not in a belligerent way, but in a way that helps their entree into a peaceful uh, entree into this world. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yes, this is a great question. I headed the Navy's Quaternial Defense Review, which I mentioned the last one last year says basically keep the two major regional contingencies. Mr. Rumsfeld came in, and I've said this on Fox and MSNBC, even when I, after I was out of, the, out of it, he really did and had the absolutely right way to try to transform the military. All these things I mentioned was what he spoke about. Maybe with his personality, he might have been successful, but we did get, I mean, because he would just dismiss, con <laughs> I mean, you know, but he got distracted. That's why I said about focus. You really only have so much attention, particularly when men and women are dying in combat. You rightfully pay attention to that. Sir, you bring up the exact point. I, is it going to be hard? You bet it is. Look, uh, my naval shipbuilding plan lingers in Congress. It's there. You can go and get it on the website. I testified about it. Admiral Clark, who was Chief Naval Operations at the time, testified about it. All those words I used were his. But we have a Congress that not in my depot, not in my maintenance building, it's a major issue. Number two, um, you can't go to that Congress and find anybody who actually understands cyberspace warfare. I mean, think what we did to Iran. We took down, probably with Israel, their centrifuges. My God, that's the warfare of the future. I'd spent a billion dollars developing that before spending $11 billion in another aircraft carrier. We gave us maybe time to prevent us from having forces go in just by a bug that was in there. But now here's your issue. And this is what I saw all the time. And, I'll, and please bear with me with this. Congress acts wisely sometimes. One time it did, and you know this from your time in the military, sir. We invaded Granada. Do you remember that? We were even born then, were they? <laughs> Gosh. We went in, and when the Marines landed, they couldn't talk to the Navy ships. The Army couldn't talk to the Navy ships to say what to do with the bombardment. President Reagan had sent us in. So one Army officer put a nickel in a telephone machine, called Norfolk, Virginia, got a Navy guy on the phone at headquarters and said, tell the ships off here to bomb at this location. 
we were four separate services. They wouldn't talk to one another. It's called jointness. Congress is not best when it mandates. Congress is best when it incentivizes. What incentivizes these service, future service members and service members to join up? One's patriotism. I believe it every day. Work with them and you'll know that. The second is promotion. I mean, who doesn't want to keep rising in ranks so you take care of your family better? If you don't rise in rank, you can't get a big, you know? And we have responsibility. And I'll talk, and the third is who owns the money. The second one, what they said is, we want everybody to be joint so that doesn't happen again. And so instead of saying you have to be joint, because there'll be like corporations, they'll figure out a tax dodge around it. Or, you know, even my wife is very good. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> is this being taped? <laughs> is what they said is, you don't have to go join. But if you want to become an admiral or a general, you got to do two joint tours and go to the joint war college. But you don't have to. Well, let me tell you, everybody wanted to. <laughs> and it created jointness because we do best when we incentivize behavior. So the third incentive is money. Who owns the money? If the Navy owns the money for both buying the hull and the connection to the army, the connection to the satellite, the ability to kind of find all these submarines by cyberspace warfare, it will always put the marginal dollar in the hull. How many? Because that's how we measure ourselves. So my belief is you have to take that money for that type of stuff away from them, give it to the joint staff. And I know this is whew, terrible to say, and say, you can buy the ships, but we are going to have priority based upon this joint interoperability, the ability to unsonify the sea and all. I know that's a very broad way of doing it, but you would then have the money in the joint force that's not supposed to be parochial, that more ships. And so that's the way you might help do it in the Pentagon. I've written an article on this I could send to you, sir. <laughs> And the second thing is, Congress is a real problem. Uh, there is much as an obstacle, if not more, because it's in my deep pool. And you can see this right now in many of the programs that are there. You know, they just keep on going. So I think it'll happen over time. The military set up cyberspace commands. Things are starting to move. Secretary Hagel, I believe, will be a wonderful secretary because I think he will let the chips fall as they might because he understands as a former enlisted man what has to be that... It ultimately, it comes down to the man or the woman. But it's going to be a slow haul, sir, and I don't deny that. But so with civil rights, and you just got to keep chipping at it. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to ask you a question about your first point, which is that the U.S. must be engaged. And I wonder, do you have any concerns as the U.S. leaves Iraq, as we get ready to leave Afghanistan, that there may be, maybe not to the extent after World War I, and not to return to isolationism, but there be kind of post, like post-Vietnam, You mean here domestically that there is one that we become more isolationist, or you mean we leave a vacuum out there? I guess both. Yeah, I do. Um, I think that individuals like Ron Paul, he's from here, isn't he? The state, Kentucky, Kentucky. Kentucky. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Ah, the son. Oh, okay. He's very, you know, I mean, he's very logical in what he says, if you believe in his philosophy. But his point is just, you know, much like America was early on, as George Washington says, we have nothing to do in foreign conflicts. Do you know what I mean? Or foreign things. There is that stream that's always been in America politics, even in the 50s. But I think that the import of what China is going to be economically, diplomatically, financially, I think we'll be able to overcome that. Um, number two is, I, am, I think we have, are less secure because of Iraq today than we were before. Um, I, I really do. And so am I concerned somewhat that we've left there a government that um, it might not be quite as bad as Saddam Hussein on humanitarian crises and things, you know, rights and all, but, but I'll tell you, you've got to act in our national interest first and foremost. 
And my take is, yeah, I think that's a little bit of a concern, but it's not the greatest because we still have bases in, and we'll continue to have, Bahrain, Oman, Kuwait, um, UAE, a fleet that floats around out there, MPS ships that have three divisions of Marine Corps, two or three divisions of Marine Corps stuff. We'll steep a presence out there, satellites, et cetera, that I think that the remaining danger is, if anything, not conventional, but terrorism starts to, you know, grow again, and that's the major concern. So I think it's going to be a tough slog. I, I'm not, when I say tactical issues, I not dismiss it. But, you know, for our economic well-being, the longer term, et cetera, I think we need proper focus in the Western Pacific with all elements of our power. Yes, Jeremy? On the same lines, uh, there's a large stream of argument that those floating fleets, the base in Bahrain, are major catalysts for anti-American sentiment, and that really the only way that we can prevent that from continuing is to kind of back off, or to, I forget what they, they it's like offshore balancing, or uh, what it's called, um, but either way, and is that not, that's still engaging, but do we need to have a, a more back-facing posture and not seem to be right on the doorstep, basically? I want to cap to what you say because this has been a consistent argument for many decades, even more today with the global war of terror and what you see often in the Arab streets. Um, and I think you are going to see us move that way for a number of reasons. There was a wonderful debate within the Navy and the Marine Corps with the Army that we have to begin to say that all our services will come from the sea. It was called the... Um, I've forgotten exactly what it's called, but we envisioned and had briefs on that it was no longer have a footprint ashore that's permanent. What we would have are ad hoc agreements that if we need to get to Bahrain for sustainability for longer term, we would, but we would have these large, I call them maritime preposition ships, but there were schemes that these things would be as large as aircraft carriers where you can actually move tanks around, bring up what you want, and they would go in from the sea. You would lift them up because we saw a future that wasn't going to be the Iraqs of the world. It was going to go in and take things down suddenly. And if you really needed more, then you'd land stuff at a base and build up from there. The part of that was cost, that these footprints are sure cost a lot. But to build this initial infrastructure at sea would cost a lot. Um, I think there's something to that because I do think, excuse me, I think there's going to be a finer balance. We've already retrenched a lot more than people know. I mean, we used to have one of our biggest bases was in Libya after World War II for about three decades. Um, Subic Bay in the Philippines was the place to be out there. Our uh, Marines are moving out of uh, Okinawa and coming back to Guam. So you're seeing some of this of na natural things. Um, but I don't think we should move if it's not military proficient for us, despite some of this in-your-face stuff. Because at the end of the day, it is our interest out there. It is in our interest to keep that Straits of Ramos open. And to have minesweepers, 12, uh, six of them stationed in Bahrain, where they go in and out port is absolutely critical. And so there's this fine balance. But I think that this, you will see more and more of this come because the Air Force has gone to long-range strike increasingly. You know, they've developed missiles that are like ICBMs that can take off and strike precision targets from the continental United States. Now, there's problems with that, too. It comes from here, it means they'll strike here, you know. But I think you'll be seeing a lot more of this. Does it answer the question? Why'd you ask it? So last year I, I did a lot of research about Bahrain and as it related to the Arab Spring. Um, and I mean, the fact that we have a base in a country that is 70% Shia, 30% Sunni, yet the 30% Sunni control the political structure and the political leadership is strongly backed by Saudi Arabia. This is uh, it's a great point, and, and you're absolutely right. And you could see that during this entire Arab Spring, and there was no answer to it. And that's the downside. You know, to some degree that we got kicked out of Saudi Arabia on the whole, you know, their base that used to be there, it's not a downside necessarily um, to be somewhere else. It's a wonderful point. If the global war tier is really about the hearts and minds, you know, yes. So you've spoken some to budgeting and how um, funds should be allocated more towards like cyber warfare over aircraft carriers. How do you feel 
the bad that holds up in a world where America is dealing potentially with enemies that are like uh, Chinese submarines, where things like this could be more beneficial versus enemies like insurgency, where you need a massive technology and also just massive boots on the ground to be effective. You need the shoulder force. Yeah, uh, well, like, who's here for the Army? Anybody? Well, Marine. But uh, um, I would think that a guy going with boots on the ground today would rather have a little drone, which they have, take it out of its backpack, they're that small, fly it around the building to see who's there so that he can call an airstrike down that guy than to have four people go around the building trying to find it. In other words, I don't want to over-rely upon this, but that's the t better type of effort that I think over in Iraq really got us down this road much better than we did. Um, I think we, it's like the Marine Corps. I think, I said this 10 years ago when I was in the Navy, the days of going across the beach are over. I think we wasted tons of money buying uh, amphibious docking ships. We should have been building what I answered the question here to Jeremy is getting those Marines up and over the beach, not on these 20 mile an hour things going to land over the beach. Last time we did this was Somalia and the journalists were there taking their picture as they came in. Do you remember that? You know, we, we're not going to do it. And actually, the Marine Corps finally had a journal of an article last week uh, where a colonel has said this. Um, warfare has changed. And I think mass is not as critical as speed as knowledge. It's not just cyberspace warfare. It's the ability that when someone shoots a, when, let's say it's Japan or whomever, all of a sudden, many of their uh, missiles that are meant to strike carriers, which they are working on, and have to come quite too far down the road on long-range missiles. When they pop out of the mountain and have five minutes to shoot, those five minutes is a kill chain for us. Can the satellite pick it up, get it to one of our ships off course, a submarine with a periscope, shoot that tomahawk up and destroy that thing. Maybe it shot one missile before it pops back in so it can't do any more. It's all about speed. The days of General Powell were very important when he said in Panama, they said, he sent 20,000 troops down there. He says, why 20,000? He said, I didn't have time to send more. I think today it's agility and speed. Speed, but the mass is not equipped and has that precision on that. And that's what I mean. It's those networks, the ability to gain, get information, turn it into knowledge, and have the agility to respond in that kill chain. It's all about time. It's the same way in the economy. If something happens in Southeast Asia, and you're up in Boston, you better know about it right away because you're probably invested in Russian bonds that have been invested in stocks in Southeast Asia, and you've got to sell real quickly. And if you find the first one out about it, you're going to sell and get rid of it. It's all that stuff. And that's what this, these little iPhones and all are permitting to do. I mean, I'm, it, but it is about speed, and, that's what, and, and the agility on this. Last, am I going over? Uh, last well, couple well, questions, if there's any. Question or yes. Or I want to make sure the same thing. I followed everything into the Japan thing at the very end. So that we're allies. We're, we're, us being allies with Japan and going in and um, defending them, if uh, the, the, a potential conflict ar arises over those islands. Yeah. But given our immense trade relationship with them. With Japan. Uh, with, 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 with China. With China. Got it. Based on the amount of goods that we get from them, is that, is that relationship something that would deter us. She asked that question earlier this morning. It's a pretty good question, I actually think. Um, I think that's the strength. When I tell you there's diminishing returns from the military, I'm not trying to put it down. If our economies are much more interrelated, <laughs> or much more relying upon one another, I think there's less propensity for a nation to do something damaging to the other country because it's going to be more damaging to itself. 
If China were all of a sudden to drop $11 trillion of reserves, of our reserves that it holds on the marketplace, it could do a lot of damage to us, but it would do a lot of damage to them. And so the more that interrelationship it is, it's terrific. But at the same time, I think for us, I th so yes, the answer is correct. But um, the reason, and that's why you have to be careful of how you draw your red lines. Formosa, which is now called Taiwan, you know, to some degree, wh why the heck did we ever get into defending that island? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Now it's an act, you know, I can remember being in the White House and we asked the Pentagon to come over with the war plans for defense of Taiwan. Because if you remember, well, you don't. You're too, <laughs> back in 95, 96, there was missiles that Japan, China was pretty upset because Taiwan was starting to move towards some independence again. You know, a guy says, we got to break severe, you know, we want to establish ourselves as the official China. And they started shooting missiles north and south and landed them in the water north and south of Taiwan. So we moved two battle groups there. And it was 95, before they owned 9%, 10% of our debt. We moved them there, which is a decrease of 10% over the past two years. We moved them there, and the shells, the rockets stopped. I always used to argue, boy, what they could do is drop $11 billion of reserves, and they'd do a lot more damage to us if we ever did that. Uh, but my point is, we asked for defense plans from the Pentagon to go, you know, what, what is it, da-da? I mean, it was kind of a commitment, but it pretty much was hokey stuff, you know? And yet, we are committed to that. So that's why I think when I say what's our China strategy, it doesn't mean, hey, China, you can't do this. You've got to work yourself through this that weighs all the elements of our power, our economy that's meant to shape them, our diplomacy that's meant to shape them, our relationship with India that's meant to shape them. And this is pretty tricky stuff. It's more easy just to move 6% of our naval forces over there, you know? You just have a congressman in Norfolk who's upset because you've taken a carrier out of there and its crew and put them in the San Diego. But this is pretty heavy stuff, and I think your point is very well taken. But that's why I say our military at times may have diminishing returns on being part of that engagement. It doesn't mean they're any less vital. I didn't mean that. It's just that the world is becoming globalized and more intricately involved. We know that many of the problems stem from poverty and not lack of social mobility. That, you know, if you're not going anywhere, maybe I don't mind turning to terrorism, you know? Um, and that's not the only very just terrorists that are PhDs, you know? But so that's, you know, I think you have to weigh it and come up with the right str uh, overall strategy. Um, why don't we uh, sort of turn to the reception now, Joe? I'm sure you'll be glad to answer yeah. any other questions on that, but I want to thank you for. Uh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs>